Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. I had a couple of good questions. Um, commentaries. I know Casey mentioned those earlier. We do recommend grabbing a good commentary, but, but wait until you've done the hard work of asking the questions yourselves. I had another good question about um, like a Strong's Concordance. Uh, Strong's is a little bit of an older one, but maybe it's the most accessible. Um, any, anything word study wise that you can think of, Casey? Like super accessible? Yeah. Yeah, Blue Letter Bible. Anybody mess with that? Yeah, Blue Letter Bible would be a great, uh, a great place to go. Just to look at a specific word, you're just like looking for the Hebrew. What would, what would the Hebrew meaning be? Um, and then if you look back at, the, uh, at page three, the thought for thought or the word for word, uh, on the right-hand side, NASB is probably going to be the closest English translation of the Hebrew. They really try to go to get accuracy in those those words. Um, and so, if you're wondering what what was the what's up, is there a better word for that? Uh, one other thing, just about words specifically, every word or most words have a, what's called a semantic range. You can use one word for various meanings, especially in English. Um, and so, words do have meanings plural, but in a sentence. A word typically has a meaning, unless it's meant to be a double entendre of some kind. So, uh, you know, the more you search to say, what does this word actually mean in this sentence? What is the, what's the author trying to tell these people? What story is he trying to say? It'll help you in the um, comprehension interpretation piece. Okay, uh, flip, if you will, to page seven. Uh, seven in your PDF, or if you got one of these books, watch online, seven here in person. Um, we have been asking the questions, what, did you, what was your past relationship with the Bible? Hopefully you had a good discussion about that, located the people around your table. Um, you, uh, you know, what's most personal is typically mo- what's most universal. So you probably found uh, that you're very similar, uh, uh, coming from the same place on this. What about the, the Old Testament? Now, uh, when we first jumped into to the Gospel of John study last semester, I had a, a faithful old friend say, Pastor Stephen, I love that we're doing the Gospel of John, but I was always taught that really life and godliness is found after the Gospels, after the Holy Spirit comes, the, you know, the epistles um, of, of Paul and Peter and John and Jude and James and, and everything that happens after the Gospels, that's really where I think we should spend our time. And I don't fault him for, for that thinking. A, a very uh, uh, well-known pastor told him that. And maybe some of you have heard some things like that. But I think uh, m- my goal uh, for this, these next few minutes together is to completely debunk uh, or, or, or to turn that whole idea on its head. Uh, we want you to see Jesus in the pages, on, on, on every page of Scripture, even the genealogies. And there are a couple of genealogies in this study, and you're going to learn why genealogies are amazing and, uh, uh, as we go. But if you will, look there on page 7. To begin with Genesis, to begin uh, learning about Genesis, we actually should start after the resurrection, I don't know if you know this about the authors of Scripture, but they, they wrote these things down. They preserved these things in such a way that you would rehearse them over and over and over again so that it's almost like when they're writing, they're assuming that much of their audience has already read it. They've already read the whole works. And, um, and so when we jump into Genesis uh, we want to look back at, we want to look forward to Luke. So this is after the resurrection, Luke chapter 24. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 13 right there at the top of the page. That very day, so the day of the resurrection, two of them, two disciples of Jesus, were going to the village named Emmaus, about seven miles, or uh, maybe your translation says about 60 stadia uh, from Jerusalem. And there they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. 
But look at this. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Their eyes were kept from seeing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? Uh, And they stood still looking sad. One of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, what things? (laughs) And they said to them, to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who is, was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But look at these next four words. But we had hoped, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, Besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at their tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of them who were with, the, with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see So you notice multiple groups of people are not seeing him, right? This is what's called uh, a lead motif, eyes and seeing. You can kind of see the, the, you know, if if you watch a movie and uh, the camera zooms in on um, a particular car, in a, um, in a in a you know mass of cars, you know something is about to happen with that car. If you see that car again, you see that car again. Um, here, Luke is is pointing your attention to this idea of seeing and not seeing, seeing and not seeing. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, "Oh, idiots, And heavy of heart or slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, which means the Messiah, it's not Jesus' last name, it's a it's a title, it's the thing that they had should the 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 person they should have been uh, anticipating. Was it not necessarily that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? You see that arc right there? That's, a, that's kind of a shorthand. Jesus has this shorthand version, this, he's gonna, this, this shorthand of what the Old Testament is all about. Jesus is saying the anointed one suffers and enters his glory. That's the interpretation, his interpretation of the Old Testament. And then he says, and then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, what does that mean? What does it mean? Moses, what is he saying? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Now, Jesus had been transfigured where he saw Moses. Does that happen again? Is Moses there with Jesus all of a sudden again? And Jesus is talking about, and says, Moses, why don't you tell him? Is is that what's happening? What's happening here? What does he mean? You can talk. He's been telling them from the beginning, but specifically, what does it mean when he says, Moses, beginning with Moses and all the prophets? What does that mean? Say again, going back to the Old Testament. What is, why would he call it Moses and the prophets? The law of Moses, which is what? Ten Commandments is part of the law of Moses, yeah? What is it? The Pentateuch, which is the Greek way of saying the Torah. Who said the Torah? Yeah, two points for Abby. Uh, so, the Torah, so, so the, the, the law of Moses and the prophets. Okay, we'll come back to that. He interpreted to them all scriptures, the things concerning himself. So let's just pause right here for just a minute. Apparently for Jesus, this little shorthand phrase, this little narrative arc of the Messiah suffering and entering into his glory was a way of summarizing the Hebrew scripture, uh, the, the, what we call the Old Testament. So the Messiah goes down into the pit of suffering 
And then he comes out into a place of honor. Flip over to page eight. According to Jesus, that simple story, the Messiah goes down and suffers and then is exalted into honor and to glory. That is the the, the summation of the entire Old Testament. So they drew near to the village which they were going, and he, I love this, he acted as if he were going farther. <laughs> I don't know why, I mean, sometimes the Bible's really funny to me. What is, it's just so good. He's just like, he's, I'm sorry guys, I gotta go. He knows he's gonna go have the Lord's Supper with them, but he's, he's like asking them, you know, uh, he wants them to beg him to stay, so they do. They strongly urged him, saying, stay with us for, toward the uh, evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay, and, and uh, one translation says he reclined at table with him, with them, and when he was at table, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. What is that? Did we hear that in the Gospel of John? What was that? What, what is that? Yeah, what, 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 did, we, what did Jesus just do? It was, the, it, was the last, it was the Passover. Yeah, it was the Last Supper. So it's, it's the exact same terminology. He took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. Uh, that was the Passover, the symbol looking forward to what happened just, to, uh, just 24 hours, or less than 24 hours later. Um, now they're doing Passover again, but it's, it's, it's maybe like the first supper. We just had the last supper, but this is the first new supper, and the symbol is of the resurrected Jesus. And it was precisely at that moment when they were eating the broken bread that Jesus had said was his body. This is my body, which was broken for you. Can you imagine being in that room? It was precisely at that moment that what happened in verse 31? And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. So the way Luke has crafted this episode um, what's the plot tension of the opening scene? We've already talked about it. What's, what's the plot tension? You've got two disciples, so you've got kind of a community that are walking and they can't see. They're going from not seeing to seeing. So Jesus comes along and, and, and their eyes are closed and this whole episode is about how Jesus' disciples can truly see What's, what's a word for that? Pastor Witt talked about it this weekend, if, if any of you were watching or here in person. What's, what's the, the big theological word for something hidden being revealed or something you, you were blind, but now you see? What's that word? It was a mystery, a revelation. I heard it, apocalypse. It was an apocalypse. Their eyes were open. Luke is showing you what the life of following Jesus is about. It's, it's these two disciples who are walking. They go from not seeing, and Jesus comes along, and they're coming with a certain set of assumptions, but we had hoped that he would redeem Israel. They're coming with a certain a set of assumptions about what the Messiah would look like, what kind of person he would be, what events he would bring um, and to, to redeem and restore Israel. Um, redeem, what does the word redeem mean? Well, the word redeem means to purchase a slave's freedom. Redemption of Israel, uh, Jesus was, was, the Messiah was to come to redeem Israel from the oppressive nations, but instead what happens? Well, the oppressor kills him. They were not expecting it. Um, and so these, they had these certain set of assumptions, um, and then something happens to open their eyes. So um, I only understand the identity of Jesus through two things. 
The first thing is, I understand the identity of Jesus through Scripture. Messiah's suffering and, and exalted into his glory is the shorthand that Jesus had in mind. But that's not it. That's not all. Because as we all know, there are people that could that, that dedicate their that are dedicated their whole lives to understanding these scriptures and completely missed the point. So the second thing you need is for the light to be shown. The narrative of scripture, as light is shown upon it by the events concerning Jesus, that his life, death, Resurrection is brought to fulfillment. It fills full the narrative of Scripture in a way that is both surprising. It's, it's, this, it's this apocalypse moment. It's this, it's this kind of take your breath away. I would never have seen it this way. But then once you do see it, you recognize that it had to happen this way. Like this is the only way it could have happened. You couldn't see it before. It was hidden. It was a mystery. But then once you see it in light of what happened with, with Jesus, that's theologians just call it the Christ event, you see that this is the only way that it could have happened. And then your eyes are open. So then back to the Luke narrative. Verse 31, their eyes were open. They recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? So this is the whole point of the apocalypse moment. The who, what, when, where, and how of your salvation, of your Messiah, of your questions, of your longings are hidden. Then God shows up with a new story, a new way to see the old story, and the mystery is revealed through the person of Jesus. So let's quickly move back down to the next story in this narrative of Luke 24. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. So uh, those disciples who were on their way to Emmaus changed their plans, they go back to Jerusalem, and they go and they tell everybody what, what, they had, what had happened to them. And as they were talking, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Shalom, y'all. He kind of walks through the wall. Shalom, y'all. Uh, but they were startled and frightened and thought it was a spirit. And he said, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands. <clears throat> Lost my place there. 39. See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and, touch me and see. See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them, again, he showed them, revealed to them his hands and his feet. So what's happening here? Jesus is resurrected and somehow in this new humanity, he still bears the scars of, this, of, this, uh, of, of the crucifixion. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, you anything here to eat? I'm hungry. Give me something to eat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. So you can imagine this kind of this tense, um, this, maybe this tense scene like after an argument in a movie uh, the, the, whole, the whole family has just argued or whatever, or, or, or someone's there who's not supposed to be there and you just hear the, clank, the clanking of, of, of dinnerware and people's mouths eating and those gross sounds or whatever. But uh, that's, that's what's happening here. But this is the whole point I'm reading to you this. Then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So there it is again. Now, I don't know if you realize this. The, the Old Testament, as you have it in your Bible, is shaped a little bit differently than the Hebrew scripture that Jesus would have had. Same books, mostly the same books, um, but it was shaped differently. The, the, the shape that he talks about there, the law of Moses is the first five books of the Bible, then the prophets, and then the Psalms, and, and, and then everything that ends. Uh, first and second Chronicles actually are, are the last books of Jesus' Bible. 
So it's a little bit of a different shape. But he says, these are my words that I spoke to you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, there it is again, apocalypse, boom. He opened their minds to understand scripture. Wouldn't that be a lot easier if Jesus just came in and just kind of waved his hand and now we understand all the scripture? Um, And hopefully you'll have more than one of those moments in this next semester. And Jesus said, thus it is written, the Christ, here it is again, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that a repentance people, that repentance and, for the, and a forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So here it is again, Jesus' summary of the Old Testament. The Messiah will suffer, rise from the dead, enter into his glory. And this forgiveness people, now he adds to it. He brings them into the story. He, he gives them a new story. This, this people who are uh, surrounded by or, or, or defined by repentance and forgiveness are going to go out from Jerusalem to Judea throughout the whole earth. So what did Jesus think about the Old Testament? How did Jesus view the Old Testament? Did he look at it as um, works-based righteousness, and you should know a few of those things, but mostly let's just keep going. Did did he dismiss two-thirds of your Bible? No. In fact, he elevated it. He elevated the book of Genesis. He elevated the book of Leviticus. He elevated the book of Nehemiah. He elevated the Old Testament in in such a way that he said, hey, when you read these texts, something is going to happen to you. Apocalypse moments are going to happen to you. Mysteries are going to be revealed to you that are going to tell you about me. They're going to redefine your story, and, and, and it's all centered around me. So, Flip over to page 10. If that's what Jesus thought of the Old Testament, if he elevated it and said, hey, if you wanna, if you really wanna follow me, if even in the 21st century, if you wanna be a disciple of me, you should make a habit of studying the Old Testament. You should make a habit of meditating on these things not just because they give you a good pick-me-up, not because they puff you up mentally, not to make you better than the other person beside you, but so that you can understand who Jesus is and how to follow him. So if that's what Jesus thought about the Old Testament, what about somebody like the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He, he trained under a famous rabbi. He knew, the first, he knew the books of Moses, the first five books of Moses, very likely by heart. He also probably knew the majority of the prophets. He probably had memorized the Psalms and the Proverbs. From the time he was a little kid, no YouTube, uh, no Disney Plus, he spent his entire childhood with his face in the book. The only childhood story we have of Jesus is of him asking questions of a rabbi, and they are astounded at how much he knows by the kinds of questions that he asks. Paul was the same kind of a guy. Paul studied under a rabbi as well and was trained as a Pharisee. And in his last will and testament to his protege, disciple Timothy, look at what he says in 2 Timothy 3, 14, 15, 16, and 17. You know John 3, 16. Hopefully by the end you'll know 2 Timothy 3, 16. Look at what he says. He says, as for you, Timothy, my young disciple, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing. Do you see a path right there already? What what path do you see in that sentence, that first half of the sentence? Continue in what you have. What what three steps do you have? We, We underlined it there for you. I guess you have the same thing I have in front of you. Learned believed, and knowing. You know what Blake talked about at the beginning? Christian story, Christian belief, Christian formation. There are many stories 
like Pastor Witt talked about this weekend, many cultures, they're telling you who you should be. Before you, when you wake up every morning, before your feet hit the ground, there's a story that you've believed about that day. Paul is saying, let Scripture shape that story. It starts with learning, learning a new story, learning and learning and learning that new story. And the more you meditate on that story, the more it informs your beliefs. And the more it informs your beliefs, the more it it, it shapes your life. It, it forms you into a person. That knowing, how many of you had a grandmother who used to say, I just, I just know that I know. I just, or, or maybe a, a spiritual father or spiritual mother would say, I just, I just know that I know. I just know in my knower. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. You can know so deeply that it changes who you are. How from, the, how from childhood there in verse 15, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. What is, what is that? What are the sacred writings? Yeah, Moses, prophets, and Psalms. It's, it's called the Tanakh. It's, it's this Hebrew scripture. It's your Old Testament. That's the only Bible he had, right? He did, I mean, Paul was writing the, the New Testament, the majority of it. He says, how from childhood you've been acquainted with the Hebrew scripture, and look at what he says it's able to do. What's it able to do? It's able to, say it louder, make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. So Paul had in his mind that this by grace through faith salvation that is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That thing that he wrote, by the way, that verse that he wrote. He, you know where he got it? from the Hebrew scripture. He got those ideas. He, the, the, so the Hebrew scripture, the book of Genesis is not gonna tell you how you can be a good person so that you can make it to heaven when you die. That's not what the Hebrew scripture is gonna tell you. The Hebrew scripture is gonna tell you that, that you can be saved only by grace through faith in the coming Messiah who will suffer and be glorified. That's what the, the apostle Paul is saying. Then, then 2 Timothy three sixteen. Maybe someone should start holding that sign up at football games. Second Timothy three, sixteen, big rainbow wig. Uh, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God and woman of God, that the person of God may be what? Complete, equipped for every good work. Where is Paul saying you can get this? From the book of Nahum? From, from Habakkuk or Habakkuk? From Genesis? You can, you can get wisdom for everyday life, for salvation, by, by reading scripture. That's exactly what he's saying. In fact, that's what the book of Psalms is all about. Hey, look back at the Torah. That's what the book of Proverbs is about. Hey, keep these things in front of you day and night. And it will take, it will take you from firmly believing, I mean, it take, it'll take you from learning to firmly believing to knowing Jesus. I, I, I've learned about Jesus and, and through this, these next few weeks together, my prayer for you and my prayer for you is that, that you're going to learn more about the nature and the character of God. And then as you learn about the nature and character of God, it's, it's going to firm, some, firm up some beliefs for you. You, know, you want to know what you really believe? How do you live a day? How do you live a day? How do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? What, what, what are the relationships in your life like? How do you treat the people who are, are worthless? How do you treat the people who are, uh, 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 have more than you? That's what you really believe. But the more you get around the character of God through the pages of scripture, the more it's going to shape what you believe and then change who you are. What did, what did Blake say? We want to be changed into the image of Jesus and Jesus and Paul say, guess what? You can do that in the Old Testament. So Casey said it might take two and a half hours to do your homework. 
I, it takes me about 90 minutes. I'm not as smart as Casey. My answers are shorter than, shorter than Casey's. Uh, and, and some of the guys, how, how long did it take you to do your homework, like for the Gospel of John? Maybe an hour, okay. Um, Lisa, how long did you take? More like Casey, two and a half hours. My wife, Ruth, I can't get any of my commentaries back from her. She just takes them. I mean, it's surrounding our bedroom. I, we, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. Um, but no, it's going to change who you are, okay? So why don't we do it? Why don't we just start? One verse. We get one verse tonight of Genesis, and then we'll open it up for some questions, okay? Is that okay with everybody? Feel good about it? Okay. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now, I'm just, I'm going to pause. I want you to do what's, what it says right there, and, and those of you who are watching. Write Genesis 1, 1 in your own words. Take 30 seconds. Just write it in your own words. It's just one sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Write it in your own words. Okay, so... As Casey mentioned, our process is comprehension, interpretation, application. So what does it say? What does it mean? And what should I do with it? How should it change me? What does it say? What does it mean? And what should I do with it? Genesis 1.1. Some of the most famous words ever written. And uh, each of you who wrote it in in your own words have just committed heresy, and you are officially banned from the church. We're excommunicating you. Uh, no, does anybody want to offer your, your own version? Anybody want to? I'm going to call on my star student over here. Caleb, can I call on you? Okay. What does it say? What did you, what did you write? At the beginning of creation, Yahweh moved. Wow. Anybody want to follow that? Man. At, yeah, go for it. Before all, God crafted what we know and have yet to discover. Ooh, that is beautiful. Man. So good. Yes, sir. Mr. Ken. Wow. I don't know if I'll get it word for word, but he said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth for us, for mankind, knowing that we would turn away from him. Amazing. Okay, any, any others? Any others? Is there a lady who would like to speak up? Chloe PG. Do you want to read yours? It's all right. Yeah. Wow. At the, abs- at the absolute very start, God created it all. And you underlined the word all. Wow. Yeah, that's very good. Very good. Okay. So here's what we want to do. Um, when we think about interpreting scripture, we, we have to go on a cultural journey. Now, there are the flat English words that are on a page. But what do I mean when I say you're going on a cultural journey? Um, you're tr- I, I have a, a friend who is kind of a friendly atheist um, who's been asking me tons, uh, I mean, Bible-friendly atheist, like reads his Bible, loves church people, um, and he's been asking me, why, why, doesn't, why is the Bible hard to understand? Like, why, like, why isn't it? Like people use the Bible to do some pretty evil things and have used it in, in history. Why is it so hard to understand? So we're, the, the answer I would give him is, is this. The Bible is meditation literature. That, that journey that Paul took us on from learning to firmly believing to knowing, that is actually the path of meditating Scripture. It, it's, it's meant to be an apocalypse. It's meant to have these hidden treasures around every corner. It doesn't just give up its value to just anybody and everybody. Now, it would give it up to just anybody and everybody, but 
only to the people who are willing to, to, to take the time to think about it and pray about it and, and see what does it mean. So uh, the cultural journey that we need to go on it, with this specific verse, uh, it requires us to lay down some hidden assumptions, okay? Uh, there are all manner of arguments that people bring to the book of Genesis, um, there, there are all manner of, of things that they want the book of Genesis to do. They want us to, uh, uh, if you're, depending on, if you're on a, a creationist argument or evolutionist um, or, or, or anything in, in between, um, th- there are all kinds of things that, uh, questions that people ask the Bible that the Bible is not trying to answer. What are the authors of scripture trying to do? Well, they're trying to tell you something about God. So no matter what the the debates or preconceived notions are uh, that people bring to this text, one thing that everyone can agree on is that this sentence is saying something like this, that the world that you and I know doesn't exist eternally in and of itself. It has a beginning. It's contingent, it's dependent the universe that we exist in uh, is dependent upon something else or someone else because it has a beginning. So if you, uh, if you juxtapose that worldview against another world religion, another Eastern world religion, like what? Hinduism or Buddhism, they believe there is no beginning. They believe it's just a series of cycles and that go round and round and round. And the point of those religions would be what? to transcend or to try to escape the cycle, you know, the, the, the car, karma cycle of uh, eternity. But this is completely different. What, what the authors of Genesis 1-1 are doing in the first words are providing a profound mystery, a profound assumption about the way everything works. That, and that something is a person and that person is God. Now, um, this, will, this will matter later, but the Hebrew word, if you want to write it down, for God is E, it's, in fact, it's, it's there. Um, if you'll see about halfway down, you can circle it if you like. It's E-L-O-H-I-M, Elohim. So I have the entire, that entire verse in Hebrew there, Bereshit, bara Elohim, Et HaShemayim, the Ed HaEretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the fact that we have a beginning is a theological statement that has profound implications and it matters. What it says is that we're heading towards something. We're heading toward someone. Um, and for some reason, God decided to speak the world into being and that is about where the agreements of what Genesis 1-1 means ends. So, let's keep moving. Here's one of the challenges. Um, Genesis is an ancient text. Like I paid $25 for that insight. Genesis is an ancient text. It's ancient. What does that mean? It, what it means is that the modern uh, mindset that you bring needs to be deconstructed to some level, at some level to understand what they're trying to say. Um, and so a uh, professor and mentor of ours, uh, Dr. Tim Mackey, has this thing where he says, if you were to travel over to another country, and, you know, maybe a European country, maybe you're going to Paris and, you know, you've got your little translation book, but you don't use it. You expect, if you just, if you expect everyone to act like an American when you go over to Paris, you're probably going to be disappointed. People are probably going to speak rudely to you because you're acting rudely. Where's the McDonald's? Where's the McDonald's? Where's the McDonald's? It's probably not the way you want to approach going to someplace like Paris. In the same way, um, when we approach Genesis, we want to come with a humble posture, come with, with uh, a spirit of charity, and we want to think, okay, uh, the person who wrote this 
wrote it in a specific time that's different than mine. One, one very important one, one important thing that happened, uh, that has happened since the book of Genesis was written, it's called the Enlightenment. This was a pre-scientific era. The way they thought of the world was different than the way we think of the world. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, I'm going to read Genesis 1-1 again and just close your eyes um, and just picture what I'm saying. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'll give you verse two as well. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, you can open your eyes. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the, let me just talk about the earth. What did you picture what came to your mind when we said that God created the heavens and the earth? What did you picture? A sphere? A planet? Anything different? What? Wildlife. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Anything else? Lots of water. You said a divide. You just saw like a two, like, one blob of space turning into two. That's really good. That's really good. Anything else? Back row, back table. You saw green and blue. Okay, very good. So most people think about a globe or, or, or a sphere or a, the picture of the earth, right? Um, how long have we known that the earth was round? I mean... Not that long. How long have we had satellite pictures of the earth, of a green and blue sphere? Anybody know? Yeah, 80, 90 years, maybe, satellite pictures of the earth. And so right away, just the first verse, the first sentence of scripture, we tend to bring this, this, uh, this assumption about, okay, what about the heavens? How long have we had a Hubble telescope? Yeah, would you say? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Stars, outer space. So in the ancient world, especially in the ancient Near East, it was a very, uh, it, it, you know, the, their, their concept of the world was what they observed. The sun goes up sun goes down. Uh, clouds move. The stars seem to be stuck up there. Sometimes they move. Seasons change, especially in an agrarian society. I mean, you think about the detail you would have to, uh, you, you'd have to keep and know about the seasons, um, about the climate, about the 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 uh, the way the day you know the the length of the days, so you know when the wise men came and they saw baby Jesus, what did, what did they what were they watching? Well, they were watching the stars. Were they worshiping the stars? Maybe, but they but but they were watching the stars, so, and the stars told them a story about the world. So a couple of different ways to 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 uh, understand this. Um, maybe the best way is to say, in the beginning, God created what's up there and what's down here. In the beginning, God created what's up here, what's up there and what's down here. That's what they're saying. So heavens and the earth um, was, is kind of an idiom. It's kind of like saying everything. Fisherman boots and pole. Uh, what's another idiom like that? Uh, um, they, uh, my wife created dinner soup to nuts. She, she, she made everything from scratch, soup to nuts, beginning to the end. Um, that's, what, that's what that idiom means, heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So does it say God created something from nothing? Where does it say that? 
Does it say that? Did it say God created something from nothing? Huh. That's interesting. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you were to ask the person who wrote this, did God create something from nothing? Well, he would say, well, yeah. But is that the story he's telling? See, in Hebrew... An equally valid way to translate this, and you see that on page 12, is when God began to create the heavens and the earth. So is this a story about material creation? Is this a story about God creating something from nothing? Uh, the, the fancy word is ontological. Is it an ontological creation? So, so let me ask you this. Uh, is this a story about God cr- cr- creating in the same way we use the word created that chair? Someone created that chair or someone created this microphone. They, they, they use raw materials and they, they created it. Is that what that word create means? You can. The word bara, that's, that's what it can mean. But it also can mean we created a Bible study. Well, what does that mean? What does that word create mean? We created a company. Chris and I are part of a, of a, a thing that, that we help create called Mountain Men. What is, what is Mountain Men? It's nothing really. Um, but there are different kinds of create. So when God created the heavens and the earth, what does it mean? Does it mean that he created it like he took the raw materials and he formed it? Well, yeah, it can. Or does it mean he created it in the sense that he, he first thought of it? Or he first, uh, he first, create, he, he first started to separate like uh, Bethany was talking about. It can mean both. So... so um, Flip back, last thing I'll say, and you have this if you're watching online as well, to page 173. What did the people of the Old Testament, what did the ancient people think of the earth? This is created by our friends at the Bible Project. We'll probably refer to this um, in Genesis 1 and 2 as we continue to study. But what do you notice right away? What are some things you notice right away? It's got the different days of creation listed there. The land and the skies. That's another translation. In the beginning, God created the skies and the land. What's up there and what's down here? Now remember, pre-scientific era, they thought that there was this vault and that the stars were kind of stuck up into this solid, watery mass, and that there were these windows that occasionally opened up and let rain come through. And the land, I mean, you can imagine if if all you could do was walk or ride on a camel or horseback or donkey, I mean, to talk to someone who had been way, way over there. I mean, how, how big is this land? Do we know? You bump up into seas. Um, again, we talked about the skies. Now, now, the mountains. The mountains were where the gods lived, they thought. Those, those were holy places. Those were inaccessible places. And by the way, the Garden of Eden is thought to have been on a mountaintop. In case he's going to talk about that, maybe next week. We'll see. Okay. So, what I wanted to do, my goal for the Genesis 1 1 thing, was just to kind of break it open a little bit, maybe leave you with more questions than, than answers. Uh, maybe this is already familiar to, to some of you. But what, what we want to do as we encounter these next uh, passages together is to ask God to show us more about who he is by asking ourselves the questions, what does it say? What does it mean? And what should I do with this if this were true? If there really is a beginning point, 
that means there really is an ending point. Someday you will stand in front of the person who is the image of God for whom these scriptures were written and about whom these scriptures were written. And the more you are uh, uh, shaped into his image, the more you're gonna enjoy that moment and, and for all eternity. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we've had to open just a little bit of your word tonight. Um, I pray that uh, these apocalypse moments happen for all of us as we're honest about what we're reading and honest about our, um, any presuppositions that we're bringing, any, any beliefs that we're hoping to hang on to, uh, but, but also honest about our worries and our fears and our frustrations. And uh, Lord, we, we trust you in this process. And we just pray that we would learn, and those learns, that those learnings would turn into firm beliefs, and those firm beliefs would turn into knowledge and understanding and wisdom that would help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Casey, what's next? You want to walk us through just next steps for, for next week? Okay. All right, so we've kicked off this evening um, with a little bit of teaching. I hope it has whet your appetite a little bit for what we're gonna be um, getting into this week. Um, and basically, you know, what we're talking about with Genesis is, is a lot of people come to this book with wondering like, how, how, how did this happen? Um, and what Genesis is seeking to answer is the why rather than the how. And so um, as you're studying this week, kind of approach it with that. Rather than asking the how, kind of start asking yourself, wait, why? Why? What, were, what was the author of this work trying to communicate to the people who would be reading it? Why would, he, why would, he, why would they be saying that? I have a question for you. Yes. Okay, so as I'm reading Genesis 1, what audience do I have in mind? Who, who would have been some of the first people to hear or read these words? Um, the, the ancient Israelites. The ancient yes. Israelites, yeah. yeah. So, so um, after Moses. Yeah, so Moses, author of the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. So that, that five book, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Moses wrote that. Mm. So, or, um, so when we read Genesis... How, <laughs> so, so, this might be a little bit of a mind bender for some of you, but Moses wrote that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So Cain, And there's arguments that some other guys helped, but yes, his, yeah. Yeah, so Cain and Abel didn't have, like, Abel couldn't have said, hey, look, God loves me more than you by pointing yeah. to Genesis 4. Mm -mm. Okay, gotcha. Mm -mm. Yeah, so Genesis, or so Genesis was written by Moses to the ancient Israelites. So he is giving them a context for what it means to serve God in the world and what it means to live under the rule and reign of, of Yahweh. Mm. So he did, but the idea of Yahweh again isn't introduced until Genesis 2. So all we know in Genesis 1 is that there is a God who started everything mm. and um, yeah. Were there any other, were there any competing creation narratives. That yes, they, they would have. there were several creation narratives that were competing with this one. So as we work through the book of Genesis, you will see um, there's other, there's actually other flood narratives. Mm -hmm. There's other um, similarities between what the people, the Israelites would have understood. They're coming, so just to give you a little bit of background, they're coming out of Egypt and there were a lot of other cultural influences mm -hmm. that they were experiencing at the time. So what is being presented to them is an alter alternative story. Mm -hmm. It's actually the true story. So they're having to rearrange and, yeah. and align their narrative with the God that they serve. Very good. Yeah. Very helpful. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, this week you are going to start in Genesis 1 with that framework in mind. 
um, with that understanding in mind. So the who, what, when, where, how. If you have any of those questions, you can you can read through this text, and then there's going to be your um, instead of if you've done the study guide before, we've done a summarized section where you summarize it in your own words. But we made a graph for you for this for this section. So you're going to look at these mm. these. Um, six days of creation, maybe a little bit differently and more in depth than you ever have before. And I'm super, super excited for next week. It's going to be so much fun. Are you guys excited? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week.